Hello, and welcome to this panel on global trends in climate litigation, lessons for the COP coming up, COP26. My name is Connor Geerty. I am a professor of law here at LSE. I've had a long, close association with Grantham, and I'm delighted to have been invited to provide a very light touch sharing for what we're going to have. And I acknowledge not only Grantham, but the Sabine Centre for Climate Change Law, and also Strathclyde Centre for Environmental Law and Government, working closely with Grantham. Uh, the plan is, the plan is to have a discussion about the policy report we're going to turn to in a moment. And then this discussion will, together with that paper, generate a short further paper or papers to facilitate further discussion at the event uh, or events indeed surrounding COP26. So this is an event which is intended to influence as we move into the autumn on this key issue. Uh, I'm going to introduce the policy report by uh, Joanna and Kate. Kate Hyam and Joanna Setzer in a moment. They're going to speak to it for about 15 minutes. Then I have a great pleasure in handing over to uh, Robert Cormuth, uh, Lord Cormuth of Notting Hill, who will be chairing the session. Then it's back to me for questions, on which do have a think about questions now. Don't leave questions politely until the very end, or there'll be one of those embarrassing Zoom pauses while we wait for people or we fabricate questions. So get in early. And uh, I have a colleague who's who's sifting them, awarding points for successful popular ones, and we'll get to those hopefully in the question and answer session. A couple of other things. One is, if you do have those questions, put them through the Q&A uh, mechanism here on Zoom. Uh, this is recorded. And uh, in some mysterious way, none of us fully understand it's being live streamed. We don't know where it's being live streamed in some in some meteoric space. We think YouTube, we're not sure. Some of us wanted our families to be watching and so on, but they'll find it and you'll find it. And indeed, you can watch it again afterwards. So that's more or less the start from my point of view. This report is dramatic. Can there be a more timely subject than Law's attempt to engage with the environment? It's extraordinary extraordinary how fast this thing has developed. And I'm not sure to whom I now turn. Is it Joanna? Is it Kate? But congratulations, congratulations on, on the report, which I've had. And uh, over to you for your 15 minutes. That I should say, Robert and I are going to be pretty tough on timing because this needs to end by 2.30. So you've got 15 minutes. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Connor. And uh, thank you to all the panelists joining us today and all of you that are listening. And um, I, I, I'm very happy to present the report today. It has just been published. So this is the first time that we're presenting and we have a wonderful panel to discuss it. As you know, climate change litigation is not new and uh, we have already looked into uh, these trends in previous reports. This is in fact the third of uh, the third report that we publish, but this one is uh, has expanded. I was very lucky to have Kate joining the team and earlier this year and contributing significantly to this report. Also a number of colleagues who uh, helped as reviewers and provided excellent comments. So this is the report today. We will begin uh, by presenting key figures. So these are the global trends from the past year, May 2020 to May 2021. And then we will look at some important current trends. And, and then, as I said, the panel will help us looking into specific cases and, and, and some of these trends. So um, let's begin here just presenting the databases. Uh, as probably many of you already know, these are the two databases that we um, maintain. The first, the blue one at the Grantham Research Institute and the other one at the Sabin Center. These databases have all the climate laws and also the case law that we will be discussing today and that is also in the report. So I encourage you to, to look into to those databases. For the US, uh, there has been a, a report published by the Sabin Center just a couple of days ago. So their, their focus is on the US and we have a global and particularly non-US focus in our report. 
Um, so yes. It, let's begin then looking into the trends. If you look at this graph, you can see how climate litigation has been significantly increasing over the past years. It started long ago in 1986 with the first case, but really it's, it's since 2015 that we see uh, this becoming a more significant trend. So um, since the Paris Agreement, we have, we have seen over a thousand cases and nearly 200 of these have been filed just in this period that we are studying. So 200 cases in, in between May 2020 and May 2021, which is the object of our, our study. And um, whereas the majority of cases continue being filed in the US, we also see how litigation continues to grow and expand uh, across the world. In this map, you can see uh, some new countries that filed for the first time cases in Guyana and Taiwan, also East African and European Courts of Human Rights. And we have, although you can't see in this map, now also observed an increase in the number of cases uh, submitted to international courts. We have 13 uh, cases that we have identified in international and regional courts or tribunals. Um, so here I come to the first finding of our new report. So this is one of the key findings, and it shows that strategic litigation is significantly on the rise. And uh, to, to have this conclusion, of course, we have to understand how we define strategic litigation. And when looking into the cases and doing this classification, what we have in mind is cases that try to advance a broader agenda. So they have they, they, they are cases that try to bring systemic change. And these can be filed against corporations or against the governments. And of course, the first thought is the big cases, it's agenda against the, the Netherlands and the Friends of the Earth Netherlands against Shell. Um, but, and, and this is where the, there's this exclamation mark. It's important to keep in mind that not all strategic litigation first is aligned with climate goals. So this is something that we observe in, in this report, that there are now a number of cases that are not aligned uh, with climate and that also have strategic aims. So for example, we see uh, cases that are brought by major companies seeking compensation for losses or predicted losses as a result of climate measures. And this is the case of the RWE case uh, brought uh, in the Netherlands, which could have a major chilling effect or similar measures elsewhere. And also uh, we see similar cases that are might not be aligned with climate, but are instead looking into protecting specific human rights. And, and, and these uh, also are a growing number of cases that we have uh, termed uh, similarly to a paper uh, recently or forthcoming with Annalisa Savarezia's um, transition, just transition cases. So th these are the strategic ones. Of course, there are all the other cases that we consider as non-strategic, which doesn't mean they are less important. All of those cases, for example, dealing with planning application of a specific uh, development that might be affected by sea level rise are also important and are also growing, but uh, the focus was on the, the strategic cases. Now, um, in, 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 in this last slide before I hand over to Kate, I want to comment on some of the findings we had by looking at outcomes of climate litigation. And, and when we think about outcomes, we can think, of course, about the direct outcomes. So um, what was the intent which the case was brought and what direction the, the judgment, the decision was taken. And, and, of, and then on top of this, you could look at the broader impacts and outcomes of litigation. So what we do in the report is this more um, simple, straightforward analysis of the direct outcomes. And what we find is that there are nearly 60% of uh, cases that resulted in a favorable outcome. So the majority of cases seem to be going in this direction of being aligned with climate objectives. But again, uh, we have to remember that not this is not the whole story. So you can have unsuccessful cases that have impacts beyond the, the, the courtroom, and these impacts might be significant 
uh, pro-climate. And also you might have cases in which you have one successful decision. So it would count as one in, this, in, in, in our quantification, but the extent to which these cases bring change are huge. So just think, for example, about the Neubayer uh, case that was recently decided in Germany and uh, the decision was given in April and two months later, you already had uh, a new act passing in parliament basically deciding very much along the lines that was were being asked in the case that uh, aimed at bringing cl climate neutrality by 2045 instead of 2050. So um, this hopefully gives you an idea of some of the key general trends. And now I would like to pass it over to Kate so she can look at some of the specific uh, trends that we identified. Great, thank you so much, Joanna. Um, and as Joanna says, I'm going to look at two uh, types of defendants uh, in cases. So first, I'm going to look a little bit at some of the analysis that we did on cases against governments. Uh, and you can see that uh, from this slide that over 70% of the uh, cases, the nearly 200 cases filed in the last year, were filed against governments. That's pretty consistent with what we've seen over time. And then I'm also going to talk about um, uh, how climate change litigation is impacting the private sector. And I know that's a theme that Nigel um, will be taking up uh, later in the panel discussion as well. So as I've said, the vast majority of cases filed uh, globally are filed against governments. But one of the interesting things that we see from the report is that we're seeing an increasing diversity in the type of government entities involved. So we still see cases filed against central government, and that's um, uh, represented here by uh, this picture of Boris. But we're also seeing cases against specific entities and particularly financial market entities that are government owned or government controlled. Uh, and so we think that's an important point to watch. Also consistent with what Joanna was saying about the number of strategic cases being filed, we see the vast majority of cases being filed by NGOs or individuals or both acting together. Uh, and one of the things that we've observed this year is that there's a, a bit of a creative move in who is being included as litigants in cases. Um, so we're seeing people with uh, specific uh, disabilities, for example, included in cases. We're also seeing um, cases being brought by political parties, uh, which is something of a first. Uh, in particular, there's some cases from Brazil where political parties uh, are challenging government failures to implement existing legislation. And the interesting thing about those is that they go directly to the Supreme Court, which is this absolutely beautiful building that you can see in the middle of the slide. So moving on then, one of the things that we did for this report, which was a little bit new, um, was we looked uh, at uh, cases against governments and we uh, picked out all those cases which really uh, focus on climate commitments made by governments or climate uh, obligations that governments might owe to uh, their citizens or to a particular class of citizens. We found nearly 100 of these cases that had been filed since the Paris Agreement in 2015, and we divided those into three groups. So the first is uh, nearly 40 systemic cases, and these are really cases that build on the arguments in the Agenda Foundation in the Netherlands case that Joanna mentioned earlier. The Neubauer uh, case that Joanna also mentioned would be included. We're also seeing uh, these cases in many different jurisdictions, and one of the um, ways that they've evolved is to challenge not just uh, the level of ambition of governments, but what they're doing to meet that ambition. And so just this week, we've uh, seen a really interesting uh, judgment from uh, court in France uh, in a case brought by um, a city, uh, the Commune de Grand Seth in northern France, where the French government has said that the, uh, sorry, the French court has said that the French government is taking insufficient action um, on climate change. So that will be an interesting one to watch. But it's not just these systemic cases that we're seeing against governments. We're also starting to see a number of cases, and we suspect this may be on the rise, that challenge specific acts or omissions by governments that are inconsistent with overall climate targets. So a good example of that from here in the UK is the case um, brought by Transport Action Network against the Department of Transport, challenging a 2014 uh, national policy uh, on transport uh, and infrastructure on the basis that that it's no longer consistent with the UK's net zero target. And then the final group of cases that we looked at for this report uh, is 
uh, cases challenging um, government decisions to authorize third party activity that could contribute to climate change. Uh, and I'm not going to touch on an example here because I know that um, Michelle uh, will be talking about the people versus Arctic oil, which is a, a great example of one of these cases um, later on. So there's a real diversity in the types of arguments that are being used against governments. We also in the report look at how climate change litigation impacts the private sector. And this is a really rich area of study, so I'm not going to be able to uh, get into it in great detail. But what I did want to do is explain this figure that we've produced to, to try and help us to uh, conceptualize some of these cases. So uh, historically in the past, when we thought about climate litigation in the private sector, we've thought about big challenges to major emitters, um, like the recent case against Shell, uh, which either ask for compensation for uh, climate damages or ask those emitters to stop their emitting activities. And we see those as really kind of the bullseye cases of uh, cases against the climate sector. What we're seeing now, though, is that these cases are starting to um, uh, diversify. So in addition to cases against major emitters uh, in the oil and gas industry, we're starting to see cases uh, against major emitters in other industries, such as the dairy industry. And those are the cases represented in the sort of dark purple circle in the center of this slide. We're also seeing a group of cases that overlap with those and which have many similarities to the last group of cases against governments, which are cases challenging specific high emitting projects and uh, companies' decisions to engage with new um, uh, brown assets. Beyond these direct cases against high emitting corporations, though, we also see an increasing number of cases uh, targeting financial market actors, uh, insurers uh, and investors, uh, and looking at what those uh, entities are doing to ensure that they're not um, financing uh, uh, climate damaging activities. Uh, interestingly, uh, while many of these cases started off focusing on disclosure uh, about how, how climate change was being managed, we're now seeing more and more of them that are actually looking at what the duties and obligations um, of those kinds of institutions are. And then the final group of cases that I think it's really important we don't forget when we're talking about how climate litigation impacts the private sector is actually those cases against governments. Uh, so we have seen as a result of the Agenda Foundation in the Netherlands case, for example, uh, a huge range of measures put in place by the Dutch government, uh, including the measures um, being challenged in the RWE case that Joanna mentioned. We also think that these uh, cases that I mentioned that are brought against a um, more diverse uh, group of uh, financial um, more diverse group of government entities could start to impact uh, the private sector in interesting ways. So, for example, if we see more cases against central banks, um, that could have a, a major impact on um, private sector ac access to finance. So I'm going to stop there. That was a bit of a whistle stop tour through the report, but I know Connor is keen that we uh, stick to time today. Um, so I really encourage you to, to check out the report uh, and to check out the databases. And I'm really looking forward to the discussion and hearing what our panelists made of, um, made of this report. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> Kate, come on, that was terrific. Uh, we've just lost the thank you, which is excellent, but thank you for that presentation. Uh, economical with time, as I've preached all should be, I'm delighted, and I know that Grantham and the team here are very grateful and very delighted to be able to welcome uh, Robert. Uh, Robert uh, has got the magnificent title of Lord Comet of, I was delighted to see Robert, Notting Hill, Notting Hill, there you are. Well, I'm actually, I actually am in Notting Hill, so. Very good, uh, you never leave Notting Hill out of commitment to this uh, period. Sorry not to be with you somewhere else. Anyway, uh, away, you. away you go. Away you go. And congratulations to Joanna and Kate on that on their report, which I've seen, and on their presentation, which was very clear. But there's an awful lot of substance there. I might just mention that this is, in a way, a sister occasion to yesterday, where we had um, another Grantham event, which some of you may have attended, on climate change legislation. Um, led by Alina Avakchenkova, and um, I, I personally think it's terribly important to see legislation and litigation together, because to some extent the key to the litigation is seeing what the sort of legal pegs are on which one can hang a case. Um, in this country, I, we'll, we'll be hearing from James in due course, we've got a fairly robust Climate Change Act, and that was mentioned yesterday, 
and so far there's not been much successful litigation, but that may change. Um, but in other countries, one has much less robust systems. And certainly as a former judge, it's been very interesting to me to see how different systems have used different methods to find a, a, a legal peg. Um, uh, there was slightly dis depressing, I must say, intervention yesterday by Michael Gerard of the Sabin Center talking about the sort of stalemate that there is now in the American Congress as far as legislation is concerned. And it may be litigation is going to become more important. Um, it's interesting that the Juliana case, uh, where, which, where the case against the government, the former Trump administration, failed in the Court of Appeal, but what was notable was that there was absolutely no dispute about the reality of climate change and the need for action to deal with it. Um, coming to Europe, one's seen um, very interesting developments, as has been mentioned in um, uh, in Germany, the German Constitutional Court, and one's beginning to, where the sort of future generations are proving to be a very important source of potential rights. And in France, where we've had the very recent Grand Santa case, which is um, certainly quite interesting. I mean, from a, I suspect they're slightly less conservative than we might have been in the Supreme Court here, but that will, is yet to be tested. Um, and then, of course, in, in Australia recently, there's been the Sharma case, which again, we find in a common law system, uh, a fairly inventive approach to developing uh, climate change rights. So um, I, I think it's, it's a fascinating discussion, this. My job is really not to talk, but to introduce the speakers. I'll do so one by one. We begin uh, with um, Michel uh, Jonka. Argueta, who I believe is coming to us from Washington, but she is um, the Senior Legal Counsel for Strategic Litigation at Greenpeace International, and um, she's been involved in a number of their cases. She's an attorney at law with the New York Bar and also a Dutch lawyer, and I think she's going to be telling us a little bit about how Greenpeace have been seeing their approach to litigation and mentioning some of her cases. So over to you, Michelle, you've got eight minutes. Thank you so much for that nice introduction and so excited to be here. Good morning, good afternoon to all. Thank you for the invitation to speak at this panel. And I would like to first congratulate the Grantham Research Team on an excellent report that is sure to help practitioners get insights and get inspired. I would like to focus quickly on how litigation is closing the government and corporate accountability gaps and how communities are using litigation as an advocacy platform. While most of the wins in court go under the radar and are painstakingly incremental in nature, they may nonetheless resonate around the world, particularly when developing international law and legal principles. Such is the case of the People versus Arctic Oil in Norway, in which, to be fair, the Supreme Court ruled against the co-plaintiffs. Other cases are big landmark cases and game changers, such as the recent Milieu Defensi and others v. Shell decision. Both cases built arguments on human rights, international legal principles, comparative and soft law. In the Norwegian case, the EIA directive and the EU Court of Justice case law influenced the findings of the court. Whereas in the Shell case, the court cited the UN guiding principles, the Paris Agreement temperature targets, the production gap report and other sources as the basis for establishing the content of the duty of care under the Dutch Civil Code. Both cases sought to close the gap in accountability that exists in the current application and enforcement of domestic and international law and the provisions of the Paris Agreement. Which gap in accountability, you ask? Consider this, 95% of the greenhouse gas emissions resulting from combustion of Norwegian oil will take place outside of Norway. These emissions were not taken into account in the environmental impact assessment done in the licensing decision that was the subject of the legal challenge in the People versus Arctic Oil case. The Supreme Court found in the majority and in the dissent opinion that these climate impacts need to be taken into account, even if combustion of this fossil fuel takes place abroad. The difference is that the majority opinion pushed the assessment to a later stage, to the production stage, stating perhaps with anthropocentric overconfidence that years down the line, the authorities will have full control over the environmental impacts of the continued expansion of fossil fuel production. At the same time, 
85% of Royal Dutch Shell's CO2 emissions are scope three. That is emissions that occur in the value chain, such as those emitted by other organizations or consumers. The court found that RDS controls and influences the scope three emissions of the end users of the products produced and sold by the Shell Group. As such, Shell was ordered to reduce its CO2 emissions throughout its supply chain by net 45% in 2030 relative to 2019. So here you have two instances where up until now, major government and corporate fossil fuel suppliers had escaped accountability for climate impacts, resulting from the supply of 95% and 85% respectively of their greenhouse gas emissions. And I have to confess that when I first started reading the report talking about how climate litigation is both advancing and delaying effective action on climate change, I had to stop and think, well, of course, litigation is a double-edged sword. And I don't just mean the proactive anti-climate litigation discussed in the report, but I'm talking about the trends also in unsubstantiated arguments, broken narratives and false solutions advanced by these actors in their defense that are cause for pause. One of these trends is the perfect substitution argument or the market substitution assumption. This is the belief that if a fossil fuel project is rejected, another one will come in its stead. And as such, approving a project will have no consequence on the environment. The argument goes on to claim, often without substantiation, that global demand will be catered by another project elsewhere. The basis for this defense ignores any effect that the restriction of supply can have on price and in turn on demand. As a result, accountability is continually and perpetually avoided. Despite the findings from Statistics Norway that only half of any reduction in production volume would be replaced by production in other places, and several other studies cited by the coal plaintiffs showing the increased consumption and lock-in effects in the economy resulting from an expansion of fossil fuel production, Norway Supreme Court accepted the perfect substitution assumption advanced by the state attorney without the state having proffered any evidence in support. Fortunately, we have seen the rejection of this assumption by courts around the world, in the US and in Australia, and most recently in the Netherlands. In the Shell case, the defendant argued that reductions by the Shell group will be taken one-on-one -on -one by other fossil fuel companies. However, the court in The Hague did not agree. It found that this cannot necessarily be deduced and that the Shell defense does not take into account the causal relationship between production limitation and emissions reduction. In the Shell case, interestingly, this defense also took the shape of an unfair competition claim and a disruption of the level playing field. The district court in The Hague found it unsubstantiated and added that other companies will also have to make a contribution and that the existence of other parties in the fossil fuel economy does not absolve Royal Dutch Shell of its individual partial responsibility to contribute to the fight against dangerous climate change according to its ability. Through strategic litigation, activists and affected communities are exposing the truth. When the courts and the public see it too, then there is also a significant breakthrough and positive impact arising from this litigation. This brings me to the last point I wanted to briefly raise regarding the GRI report, the who of climate litigation. As you all know, climate change is a human rights issue and a social justice issue. Climate change disproportionately affects women and children and other vulnerable communities. We can see that even at a temperature increase of 1.1 degrees, climate impacts are falling disproportionately on populations that are disadvantaged and disenfranchised. At the core of these issues are the different layers of oppressive power and the injustice of vulnerable communities bearing the brunt of climate change. That's why it is so important to litigate also on rights-based claims and provide a platform through the litigation to affected communities. As such, I would frame climate litigation not only as an effort to close the accountability gaps, but in the broader context of seeking climate justice and social justice. Over the last years, we have all witnessed the rise in activism and public participation. Outrage from the younger to the older generations. This could, as the report indicates, be driving the rise in advocacy through litigation as well. We're also seeing more cases with successful standing granted to thousands of co-plaintiffs for a single case. We can expect as well more cases and more spotlight on those cases coming from the global south. These are all promising developments as social movements get their day in court. To close, I would like to turn to the thought-provoking and spicy question raised in the report. Does litigation advance 
or undermine climate action. Looking at the People versus Arctic oil case, it was under the traditional sense a loss for the co-plaintiffs, but it was favorable in its ruling on the responsibility of Norway for exported emissions. The Supreme Court understood the severity, but missed the mark on the urgency of the climate crisis. As such, six individual applicants and two organizations have launched an application to European Court of Human Rights. Looking at the Shell case, establishing the responsibility of corporations to reduce emissions as independent and additional to that of the states, and having this responsibility extend to scope three emissions is truly unprecedented. I share the view of the report that we can expect really interesting developments in climate litigation that will draw from the findings of this groundbreaking case, which was led by Milieu Defensing. As discussed, litigation is a double-edged sword and it does come with a hefty price tag at times. Some wins are landslide and some are so technical, it will take more action to enforce and bring about the accountability of polluters and the vindication of rights of affected communities. All things considered, my question to the audience is, what is the price of inaction? Thank you for your time. Thank you very much indeed, Michelle. That was a fascinating review of the particular of those two cases and you challenge the audience that will have when they come back on that. Now we turn to the other side of the world, I think. I'm not sure where Brian actually is physically. Are you in Manila? <laughs> yes, I'm in Manila. Manila. <laughs> but you come originally from Australia, I think. But anyway, Brian um, is going to, uh, she's a climate change lawyer and environmental lawyer working in the Asian Development Bank's Law and Policy Reform Programme. Uh, and they've been very active in the uh, in, in training of, of judges and others, and I've been happy, lucky to take part in some of their programs. But she's led the research and writing for their four-part report series, Climate Change Coming Soon to a Court Near You, which is a fascinating and very important review of both litigation and legislation in the Asian uh, world. And so she's going to talk about that. And you have eight minutes, Rani to tell us all about that. Quite the challenge, thank you so much. I'm delighted to be here. And thank you also to the Grant, uh, Grantham Research Institute. So as Robert mentioned, I work in, um, in ADB's team. We work with judges to support environmental law and climate change. So thank you so much to the team at Grantham Research Institute. These reports on trends in litigation are so important for those practitioners to understand the trends in the work that we do. Uh, and as Robert mentioned, we, we published late last year a, a series of reports, Climate Change Coming Soon to a Court Near You. I'm being asked to hold them up. I will place the web link in the uh, chat. But with our report series, we really wanted to convey this message, and that is, um, Asian and Pacific judges have ideas that are worth sharing. They add diversity to the global discussion on climate law. And lawyers based in developing regions benefit from sharing judicial techniques because they frequently challenge, they frequently have to deal with the same challenges. So turning to Asia and, and, and responding to the report. So Asia sees um, a broad range of climate litigation, but I want to focus on two personality traits of climate litigation in Asia and the Pacific. And the first is that most of the litigation that we see is that strategic um, rights-based approach using constitutional rights. Um, Asian jurisdictions have favored these approaches for a number of reasons. Petitioners commonly argue that uh, an act violates their right to law, dignity, equality before the law, or even an environmental constitutional right. And this emphasis on universal rights makes these cases um, easily applicable in the climate change context, but it also is easy for different jurisdictions to pick up this litigation and run with it. And I think that's why we're seeing so many jurisdictions run these cases. The preference for rights-based lit litigation in Asia will continue. And there's a couple of reasons. So um, many legal frameworks in Asia and the Pacific are still catching up. So there are gaps in the laws. Um, in parallel with that, 
the majority of the constitutions in the region are relatively young. So they embed social and political rights. Um, and we surveyed 32 countries in South Asia, Southeast Asia and the Pacific. 60% of them have a right to environment or a clean environment, or they direct the state to care for the environment. And these provide grounds that people can sue on in public interest litigation, and they help people overcome burdens to standing. Now, uh, constitutional writs also enable people to sue directly in an apex court, straight to a Supreme Court, and that saves time. That's a big deal if you are in a, in a jurisdiction where courts are not efficient and it might take you, you know, five to 10 years to run a commercial dispute. So that's, it, that's why you will see more use of constitutional litigation, even for commercial context and even in EIA type challenges because litigants need to save time in, in climate litigation. The other point about constitutional writs is that they might just provide greater leeways of choice for climate conscious lawyering, something Justice Brian Preston talks about, because the very discussion of fundamental rights in the face of an existential threat combined with broader remedies under constitutional writs provides um, potentially some remedies that can be a better fit for the situation. And I'm going to draw an example of the Ligari case. I know it's not recent, but in Asia, there is a, the technique of writs of continuing mandamus. And in that case, the court held the matter open on a rolling basis to keep asking the government to come back and the Climate Change Commission to come back until it was satisfied that there had been implementation, because implementation can be an issue in Asia. And another example of courts looking at constitutional rights and providing a big decision is a relatively recent case from Nepal, Shrestha and the Prime Minister and Office of Council of Ministers, um, the court ordered the government to pass a climate change law. There wasn't one there, but there was a policy. And the court considered it was an ex existential threat that was undermining constitutional rights. And such a decision was, was reasonable. Okay, turning to the second trait is adaptation litigation. So Grantham's report rightly notes that adaptation litigation is lagging. Um, and most of it occurs in Asia, uh, sorry, not Asia, the US and, and Australia. Um, there is Asian litigation on adaptation. Like the rest of the world, it's not as common. But the cases tend to be environmental litigation and they're based again on constitutional rights. And they may not specifically mention climate change. Instead, they might be these unsexy, routine environmental law challenges that are excluded under a more narrow definition of climate change litigation. And when we wrote our report series, we had to really ask the question of what our purpose was. And we want to help lawyers bring better cases and judges to make decisions. So we really had to ask, what are the cases that make a difference. And we wrote about lawsuits uh, protecting mangrove forests, flood zones, rivers, glaciers, and agricultural land. And in the context of COP, nature-based solutions are still not receiving the attention they deserve, and neither is funding. So uh, we feel really strongly about broadening constructs and definitions and the framing for adaptation litigation so that we can start talking about um, cases in this broader context. I want to quickly turn to another case which is an adaptation, a true adapt climate change adaptation case from Pakistan in April of this year, DG Khan Cement. So this could have been a routine case, a climate, sorry, a cement company challenged environmental rules that prohibited it from building new plants or expanding those plants in an environmentally sensitive area. But when the, the court received a matter, obviously it looked at 
the legality of the regulations, but then it, it took a broader construct and said, we are talking about climate change. And when we talk about climate change, we must now look at stakeholders like future generations. And I love this quote, the court considered that through its jurisprudential, jurisprudential fiat, it must decolonize the future of the wrath of climate change. And so it must do that by upholding the fundamental rule of law. And that was critical in climate democracies. So just to sum up, I think these decisions and this discussion highlights just a few things. It's just that judges in Asia and the Pacific have a different way of doing, doing things, but they have ideas that are worth sharing and we need diversity in this discussion. Rights-based litigation will continue to trend and it might, might allow for more responsive remedies. And thirdly, nature-based solutions are critical for adaptation in Asia and the, the Pacific, where climate change is already on people's doorstep. So let's champion this litigation and bring it into the, the, the discussion so that we can highlight this as a response that's suitable in this age. Thank you. Thank you very much, Bryony. That's very clear and very interesting about the sort of lessons we learned from the other side of the world. Um, we now, at least for me, come back home with James Morici, um, a, a barrister from Landmark Chambers, um, who specializes in planning and environmental law and was in fact lead counsel for the Department of Transport in the recent judicial review challenges to the airport's national policy. Um, at Heathrow uh, and raised issues uh, uh, on, on climate change. So he's very much seen how these issues can work out in our country and in a country which has a very strong climate change legis legislative base. So over to you, James, eight minutes. Thank you, eight minutes noted, thank you. Um, so I've, I've been asked to really uh, focus uh, today on uh, recent public law climate change litigation in the UK, and in particular that which has tried to uh, enfor enforce or give effect to um, the Paris Agreement uh, through uh, litigation. And um, I'm, I was going to um, see if I can move my screen on. Yeah, here we are. So there's a number of recent cases um, in the last um, year or so. Um, many of which, or at least some of which I'm sure you will have heard of. The first one's the one that Robert's already mentioned, um, Friends of the Earth uh, and Heathrow, the challenge to the government's uh, national policy statement favouring Heathrow expansion. We then the Packham case, which challenged the government's decision to carry on uh, with High Speed 2. Um, we also had uh, the Client Earth challenge uh, in relation to a development consent order granted for a gas fire generating units at the Drax power station. Uh, and then perhaps most recently, Elliot Smith, um, which uh, was a decision ch challenging a decision of the, U the UK government to set up the UK emissions trading system to replace the EU emissions uh, trading system. Um, and there's also the Transport Action Network case, which I think Kate mentioned uh, earlier on, which I think was heard um, earlier this week, uh, and which we're waiting for a decision on that's challenging the road investment strategy that provides the finance uh, for um, uh, road uh, infrastructure in, in the UK. And the theme of uh, many of these cases was an attempt to place reliance on um, the Paris Agreement um, to say that it hadn't properly been considered or, or considered at all um, by the government. And I think one has to understand just a little bit about the chronology. And, and I think one of the things that's interesting is why are these big cases focusing on Paris when we have our own, uh, as um, well, Karma said, our own um, pretty robust climate change uh, legislation in the UK. I think some of the reason for that comes from this chronology. Obviously, we know when Paris was, ad was adopted in, in uh, late 2015. Um, what then happened in the UK was that late in 2016, the Climate Change Committee advised the government not yet to amend our own targets in our Climate Change Act in the light of Paris, but to sort of wait and see uh, what happened. Uh, the UK then ratified Paris Agreement and the Climate Change Committee then invited the government to seek further advice from it in the future uh, 
after the IPCC's report was available uh, in 2018. And it was in that context, the Secretary of State designated the airport's national policy statement uh, favouring Heathrow. So at a time when our legislation hadn't been amended to in any way to reflect uh, Paris on advice, but that was the position. The report then came out uh, later on in 2018. Um, by which time there were already judicial reviews um, on foot of the um, decision of the Secretary of State to designate the MPS. And then while that litigation was still ongoing, the new target was introduced into the Act to effectively reflect net zero, to reflect the um, Paris uh, Agreement. Um, and then um, it was after that that the Court of Appeal gave judgment in the Heathrow case, saying the government had not taken account of Paris when designating the policy in those days before our, our legislation had been amended to reflect Paris. But then not long afterwards, the Court of Appeal in, in the Packham case, two of the same three judges who heard the Heathrow case seemed to sort of retreat from the position in terms of the relevance of Paris. And you could see the retreat um, beginning. And then the Supreme Court eventually overturned um, the decision of the, of the Court of Appeal. Um, and what you'll see from these cases is that to, until that order came in, which amended our act to reflect the 2050 target for, uh, for Paris and a net zero target. Um, effectively, un until that came along, um, that was the focus of what hadn't been taken into account in decision making through Paris. After that target was amended, the decisions obviously changed because they're now taking into account the new domestic target that reflects Paris. But the argument is that there are other aspects of Paris that have not been taken into account, not just the target that's now reflected in legislation, but for example, the fact that Paris, it's said, requires urgent action to be taken. Um, so what are the themes that I can draw from these cases? Well, um, all of them are judicial reviews of projects or policies. And, and indeed, I note that the report that we've had presented notes that same trend in relation to UK cases. They do seem to be that type of litigation. Secondly, all of the grounds were based on a failure to consider or adequately consider, adequately consider Paris, and in particular, the net zero, to the extent those obligations hadn't been transposed or transposed fully into domestic law. All the arguments are very similar or, or the same, and they've all ultimately failed. Um, and um, I think what I would note about that is that obviously um, in the Heathrow case, the judicial review was of a policy that predated the amendment to our act to reflect net zero, to reflect Paris. So at a time when the Paris was a wholly unincorporated international obligation so far as the UK was concerned. And obviously the Court of Appeal found nonetheless that the uh, policy was unlawful for not having taken into account the Paris Agreement. And that caused a huge stir. People were talking very big about it, saying it was the UK's agenda. But there were cooler heads saying the Court of Appeal's decision was in terms of our domestic law here, surprising, brave, which are normally uh, equivalent words for wrong, um, or even as the Lord Quarterly Review article that Lord Carmouth drew my attention to, a flight of fancy. And the Supreme Court overturned all of that in quite comprehensive uh, terms uh, in due course. And so, I would just want to reflect for a moment on what the difficulties are in using Paris in the UK system, and, and not just the UK system, but other systems that have um, a dualist system like us, where unincorporated international treaties cannot give rise directly to legal rights um, and uh, obligations in domestic law. And that is the position it's been very much reaffirmed by the Supreme Court's decision uh, in Heathrow. So often you are limited to arguing that it's that Paris was a, a relevant consideration or other international treaties a relevant consideration. But under our law, uh, although those treaties that are unincorporated can be relevant consideration, they're not things that normally have to be considered, but that, that can be considered. Uh, and you can only challenge the decision for, for not having considered if it would have been irrational not to have considered it, i.e. so obviously material was this convention that you had to consider it. And that's a difficult challenge. Uh, or you're left to argue about not fully considering these issues under the EIA or the SEA. Again, not easy after Heathrow. Uh, and it's also not easy because if you're trying to argue for something that the Paris Agreement you say requires, because it, to the extent it's not incorporated uh, in, in, this, in, in, in the UK, the UK courts don't usually want to interpret unincorporated obligations, and they just look at, instead, whether the government's taken a tenable view of what the obligations are, not what the obligations actually are. Um, moreover, I think it is important to notice about Paris that it, there's a particular thing about it, not just when it's unincorporated uh, do we have the issue of the dualist system here, but many of its obligations are not freestanding. They require domestic action to implement them, like nationally determined contributions. So it's hard to put it up there on its own. 
Um, and then I think you know the recent case law perhaps suggests there is quite a hostile environment at the moment for running these kind of points. And what claimants seem to be doing is just re-arguing the same points, which I would just say, you know, good good luck on that. Um, and then what's the alternatives? Well, stepping beyond the current range of limited arguments about you didn't consider it properly, you should have taken this into account. Um, if you're relying on those parts of Paris that haven't been incorporated or some new international convention that comes along um, in due course uh, dealing with climate change and you want to rely on that, there's three arguments you might pursue that so far haven't really, you know, really been pursued that strongly. One is to the extent that you know, Paris has now been transposed or, or any other future obligations are transposed, they are relevant now in interpreting domestic obligations, e.g. our amended target. Secondly, human rights. These are really quite marginal points in Heathrow by the time of the appeals, not really an issue at all in the other claims. But it is an exception to our rule about unincorporated obligations that you can take them into account in interpreting the content of a European Convention of Human Rights right. So that's another area which I'm not saying it's remotely easy, but where there might be room to manoeuvre. And then the final one, which I think is very interesting, but for sure really difficult, customary international law. If something's customary international law, it informs our common law. And um, if you can argue uh, in the future, maybe, that these obligations form customary international law, that might be a route in. I'm not pretending for one moment, uh, one moment that that's easy. Um, but I think it might be preferable to start thinking out of the box in terms of these arguments rather than rerunning the same arguments that just hit a hit a brick wall uh, with, with our courts. And rightly so in terms of our own legal system and the rules that we have. Thank you. Right. Thank you very much, James. You're, you've all been very good at keeping to time. And those are some very interesting questions. And then last of our designated speeches, we have Nigel Brooke who is a London-based um, uh, partner and insurance specialist at Clyde & Co. And he leads their resilience and climate change risk practice. And I think he's going to be looking a bit at the focus of litigation as it affects the private sector defendants and um, some of the implications of recent litigation for corporations around the world. So over to you, Nigel, and again, you have eight minutes. Thank you, Robert. I'll speak fast. <clears throat> I'm going to hit um, three main themes. This has been a very active period for litigation against corporations. And even though they represent only a quarter or so of all total cases, they're on the rise. And we're seeing some um, new themes coming through. I'm going to focus on three. First is strategic litigation against corporations, we're beginning to see. And obviously, led by the Shell case, talking about the implications of government actions, particularly government actions which are spurred by climate litigation, uh, the implications for corporates. And then thirdly, looking at value chains and the pressure on them through the courts. So um, Michelle's already um, opened up about the, the case, Moody de Fancy against uh, Royal Dutch Shell. But this is groundbreaking in so many different ways. Um, it, it is obviously a, a prime example of strategic litigation. So unlike the case in the USA, this isn't an effort to obtain damages for past emissions. This is trying to alter behavior um, going forwards. The, um, it's also um, inspired by cases against governments, in particular, the case, um, successful case brought by Agenda against the Dutch government, um, culminating in the Supreme Court decision at the end of 2019. And much the same basis was used by the uh, claimants in this case, in a successful case against Royal Dutch Shell. In particular, duties based on um, human rights and some other soft law obligations, which found favour with the Supreme Court. And I'm wondering if this is going to become a theme that where um, the cases against governments go first, uh, cases against corporations follow after. And we have seen, particularly in Europe, uh, this run of successes, um, including against the German government and the French government, uh, with uh, this latest one this week being um, a very strong judgment, um, ordering the French government to do better within the next nine months. So I think back to Royal Dutch Shell, the other distinguishing factors of it um, really make it stand out. First of all, that um, Although Royal Dutch Shell is one of the more ambitious of the oil and gas majors in 
committing to net zero by the middle of the century. Uh, nonetheless, they've been told that isn't good enough. And in the medium term, you must do a lot more than you're currently planning. So there's 45% cut by 2030, which would be by far and away the steepest cut of any of its um, peers. The um, being held to a specific target as well, not simply being told in general terms you must do better, but being held to something quite specific, which is derived from uh, the 2018 IPCC report. Um, also, as Michelle pointed out, this is about not just Shell's own emissions, but um, indirect emissions, their scope three emissions, the, the emissions from the consumption of their products. Uh, which touches on the point I'll make later about value chains, that this is not just about a corporation. And of course, although the judgment is against Royal Dutch Shell, the company that's headquartered in the Netherlands, they've got to ensure that all of the Shell operating units, a thousand of them around the world, that uh, comply with this, the, the judgment. RDS itself will be held responsible for that, but this will have implications for all of Shell's operations around the world. So. It could hardly be more powerful. I think the only um, small concession made to RDS in this case was they were held to uh, the reference point was 2019 emissions rather than some earlier year. But otherwise, um, it was a comprehensive uh, defeat in this first instance decision. Shell's already said it will appeal, but interestingly, it has also said it will um, adopt uh, more ambition. Um, so this. Um, Everything about this case is groundbreaking. That the, the amalgam of um, hard law and soft law that, that inspired the, the new duty of care that's been imposed uh, on Shell. And we wait to see whether this will have implications elsewhere. Second theme is about um, what happens to governments and the implications this has for corporations. So turning back to the Agenda decision, um, Agenda. Uh, the court decided that the Dutch government had to make deeper cuts by the end of last year. So the, uh, having lost to the Supreme Court in December 2019, the Dutch government had just over 12 months to take steps to comply. And the biggest step it took was to uh, accelerate its planned closure of coal-fired power stations. It wanted to do that over an extended period. It, it tightened that period. Within months, two new actions were filed. Uh, two arbitrations, one by RWE, another by Unipa. These are companies that were operating coal fired power stations and were told you're going to be closing them years ahead of schedule. They brought claims under the Energy Charter Treaty, uh, bilateral treaty, claiming compensation, each of them claiming over a billion dollars um, in compensation for de uh, being deprived of what it says are its commercial rights. And this again. I think it's a theme we may see playing out in years to come as governments do become more ambitious when they choose to or when they're forced to by the courts. This will have real world implications for corporations, uh, specifically, of course, particularly those operating um, heavy emitting infrastructure, such as coal and gas fired power plants, which will be quite likely high on the list to be targeted by countries that want to be more ambitious. But um, there's also then uh, the case that Brioni touched on, the DG Khan case in Pakistan. So again, this is the Pakistan government adopting measures to um, limit the growth or, or uh, expansion of cement manufacturing because of its contribution to climate change. DG Khan unsuccessfully trying to, to halt that. But again, we can see this playing out, this tension between governments and corporations and the broader theme of who pays for who, who pays for the implications of the transition, particularly when it starts to accelerate, when, when in, in other words, it advances faster than corporations had envisaged in their business planning. And this is when, of course, we see um, stranded assets emerging uh, and losses being born. The allocation of those losses, I think, is going to become a big theme in years to come. And then we also have the cases brought against uh, national and international banks, uh, including by Client Earth, um, either to um, green up their um, uh, build back better after COVID uh, or to challenge their um, support of uh, carbon intensive projects 
to the degree this pressure succeeds, again, this will choke off funds for uh, the heavy emitting corporations. And so again, has implications. And that goes, takes us to the final theme about value chains and the multiplier effect. But if you can hit a one a, a, an entity, be it a corporation or otherwise, which um, has a disproportionate effect on its counterparties, then that can have a multiplier effect. So again, the Shell case is a classic instance of this, being ordered to uh, reduce not only their own direct emissions, but also their scope three emissions, they, which represent the vast majority of their emissions. They're the ones from the consumption of their products primarily. They are, if to the extent that they comply with this, and they do so not by, for example, selling their operations, which would be lip service to the judgment, but would, would I suppose, comply, but actually um, close down operations. Um, that could have an impact on um, the wider emissions. And strategic litigation increasingly seems to be about this. Who are the players who can, um, if we can move them, will have a disproportionate impact on, on the wider world. So there are statutory um, moves in this direction. So we already see um, a due diligence law in countries like France and Germany we're soon going to get an EU directive later this year, which will oblige all corporations around the EU and quite a few who are operating into the EU to conduct due diligence and go looking for um, human rights and environmental violations to try to put them right, uh, to report on what they find and to um, offer redress to those affected. And this obviously is not primarily aimed at climate change. Uh, it would be um, things like deforestation and so on, like the casino case that features in uh, the uh, GRI report uh, would be perhaps a classic case, but it almost certainly would extend to uh, climate change as well. So again, this multiplier effect that if all corporations in of any size in um, the European Union are obliged to comply with this, they will put pressure on their contractual counterparties and perhaps further up and down their value chains as well to comply as well. So that there's again this, this disproportionate impact. And again, cases against banks currently only against or primarily against national and international banks, but potentially against commercial banks as well in the future. Again, um, financial institutions are multipliers that if, if, um, if they decide to turn uh, the tap off or turn it down, that has, a, again, a, an enormous impact on a wide variety of corporate players. So I think some big, big themes, the, the shell case is the, the kind of poster chart of all of this, it illustrates all of those themes, but uh, that something else does seem to be happening. Just one concluding thought on this, one of the um, ins inspirations for this new duty of care in the Dutch case was the UN guiding principles, um, which is aimed at, um, business and human rights. So this is saying governments owe obligations to protect and respect human rights, but corporations should themselves respect human rights. And it spells out some principles. All of those principles find their way into the, the, the duty of care. They also find their way into this new EU directive. And this, this, actually, this uh, UN guiding principles um, date back 10 years. As we get this perhaps turning into a, from soft law into hard law through statutes or all through the, 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 the courts, again, um, this would have implications both for governments and for corporations. I think Nigel has stopped. I have. Succinctly, as, as, as did all of you. So we actually have the right amount of time. So congratulations. Robert has now morphed into a participant in the seminar. So he's entitled, if he wishes to respond to the questions that are coming up and thank you all so much for the questions. We've had tremendous numbers. Uh, and uh, we're gonna pick a few that have kind of risen to the top as it were of the pile of those that have been asked. And uh, we're going to do an old school catch my eye by waving your physical hand. I'm talking now not to members of the general public though we love you, we don't want you doing that. 
we want uh, the panelists and Robert uh, to do that if they want to. I'd like them particularly to do it because uh, we want to try and get as many questions in as possible. And I'm going to start with one which is directed to Joanna and Kate, and then a couple of general ones. But if any of you feel, I won't presume to, to designate, but if any of you feel that it's particular to you, that would be helpful to me, because then we could get through the questions, as it were, quickly. And there's been quite a lot. The first one uh, comes from Alexander Weber, uh, a graduate student in Sao Paulo. Alexander, thank you. And this is for Joanna and Kate specifically. And here it goes. A couple of questions. Could you expand on interesting cases of legal action against subnational governments? Subnational governments. Uh, and secondly, we we'll let her have two. She was the first off. Are there cases against municipal services of public transport regarding targets of emission reduction? Are there cases against municipal services of public transport regarding targets of emission reduction? While uh, while Joanna and Kate are thinking about those. I'm testing my physical hand expectation. Here's one from Nimrod Muhumuza, University of the Western Cape, South Africa. Is there any evidence that climate litigation is moving the needle on awareness on government policies, et cetera, in the global south? And I think the take home here, particularly Africa. So something about that would be interesting for Nimrod, and I'm sure many people here. And the second of the questions aim generally, and they'll go round the group unless I get a hand, is from Kevin, public law, international law student, the University of Aberdeen. Uh, do you think a human rights approach should be used to compel states and private entities to tackle climate change? So those are the two, Kevin's and Nimrod's. We start with Alexandra's doubleheader, uh, well, we have two people, so maybe you'll divvy it up, but you're going to have to wing it a bit. Joanna, shall I go to you first? You're the top of my screen for some reason, and then bring in Kate. Sure, thank you. Um, so on the question about uh, subnational governments, I think it's interesting to think that subnational governments can be in either way, in the side of the, the story. So we have a number of cases that have been brought by subnational governments. So in, in the US, we have... Uh, uh, over 30 cases brought against carbon majors where cities and states and counties are asking um, for uh, basically liability of these companies for damages. And, and then we uh, also have cases brought by subnational governments against the federal government. So it, it really shows how subnational governments are in this multi-level uh, governance of climate change in, in many different roles. But uh, then, of course, they are also uh, subject of litigation and they have been uh, involved in a few cases. So I imagine uh, one of interest would be a case brought by uh, a group of parents in Brazil against the state of Sao Paulo. So this is a, a a, a case that is questioning legislation that provides um, incentives for uh, auto uh, uh, for cars, and um, and I think that that's an, an important issue actually that this question raises not in only in regards with subnational governments, but how um, we can see uh, the incentives and subsidies provided by governments being challenged through litigation. So um, I, I give a, a broader answer to the question just because I think that subnational governments are a critical actor in this story and that they can be involved in a number of cases from both sides, as I said. I want Kate to mention a few other cases that um, we also have involving subnational governments. So I will pass quickly to her and uh, hopefully we have time to cover so many questions. I gave a look at the number of questions we have. I really hope we can get through as many as possible. Thanks a lot, Kate. You volunteered to do Africa if you want. But can we, I mean, do Africa, go on. The things you're saying, you're trying to save time. Uh, feel free to do so uh, as well as addressing Alexander. Okay, so um, just to, to touch then on this point about subnational governments first, I think uh, you know many of the cases that we've talked about today actually already involve subnational governments. So uh, the DG Khan Cement case that Bryony was talking about, that is against the government of Punjab. And I think that shows that um, 
because all levels of government have some responsibility for climate action, all of them are susceptible to um, uh, climate litigation. Uh, interestingly, we don't have, other than the, the Sao Paulo case that Joanna was talking about, many cases um, with a transport specific focus yet. I imagine that may come. Um, there is a, a case, um, uh, Friends of the Irish Environment against Fingal County Council, um, which looks at uh, uh, Fingal County Council's approval of an airport expansion, um, but I think that's the only one I can see. Um, and then to the, the question about uh, African uh, cases and, and what could be done to advance uh, climate change uh, litigation in Africa, you know, I think this is a really interesting question, and it goes again to what Bryony was saying about some of what we need to learn from the Asian context, which is that when we're talking about climate change litigation in this report, we're adopting a fairly narrow definition. You know, we're uh, saying only cases which kind of explicitly put climate change front and center are going to be included in this category. But actually there is some really interesting and potentially very powerful um, jurisprudence coming out of courts in Africa that is, um, you know, really focused on issues that we would all say are related to climate change, but that isn't necessarily using that kind of explicit framing. So recently, for example, there's a case that's been filed in Uganda, supported by Client Earth, which is challenging the Ugandan government's failure to implement a sufficient disaster risk management strategy in regard to landslides that have been getting worse and worse over time. And there are numerous communities that have been, you know, horribly affected by this, but they can't move from uh, areas where where landslides are common uh, because they don't have the, the government support that's needed. And so I think we would all look at that and say, well, of course, climate change is exacerbating this problem. Uh, and uh, this is a, an adaptation case or in maybe even be a loss and damage case in some ways, but it's not necessarily framed explicitly in those terms. That case does mention climate change once, but it, it's not a, a huge element. I'm, I'm, I'm going to take Bryony. But Bryony, we have an outstanding question, which is about human rights approaches to compelled states and private entities, which I half wondered whether Robert might want to answer. And can I do this slightly cheat? We have a question coming in for you, Bryony, for you directly from Carlotta Garofalo, who is a PhD okay. student from Grass. Yeah, all right, fixed. Uh, you know her, right? Okay. Well, no, yes, no, I don't. No, I, no, I don't. I'm just trying to be friendly. <laughs> oh, very good. We're very successfully friendly, if I may say so. So you will have wanted to have intervened, but I want you also to think about the following. Considering the vulnerability of Asian and Pacific countries, do you think that Asian and Pacific jurisdictions could be a promising forum for strategic litigation, seeking for compensation for adaptation costs uh, for losses from climate change, etc.? Uh, do I need to repeat it? Do you get it? That's from Carlotta. So by all means, what you're about to say, and also that, and human rights is an option. Okay. Um, let me just start on the state litigation. Um, please do look at our reports. You will find that in any of the federal jurisdictions. So India has many, many cases where people sue the states. There's a great decision, Manu Anand and the state of Kerala, which is about protecting um, agricultural land from an industrial development and the court really goes into this and says you know we know that people will need food by 2050 we're not going to have enough agricultural land it's not going to be doing what it needs to be doing so let's protect it for climate for food security in the face of climate change so yeah federal jurisdictions are um, as as Kate mentioned they're really important because there are many permitting decisions that happen at the state level and that's where you will see that um, that litigation. Turning to rights and compelling action. Yeah, those cases are, is that was, a, that was the question, right? Rights, compelling uh, action. More, uh, more or less, yes. On, on uh, adaptation, right? right? Approach to use. Well, you'd answer as you wish, yeah. yeah. Yes, on adaptation, it has. There has been one unsuccessful case, unfortunately. Um, it was a case from Bangladesh where it's about um, disaster. So the communities sued the national government, government of Bangladesh for disaster relief in the wake of a cyclone and said that there was a, an obligation to ensure that people had um, access to um, food, um, to be resettled because I think uh, within 18 months, people hadn't been resettled and were still living in, in camps. Um, that case really stalled and didn't get anywhere. I think you will see more of it in Asia. Um, 
we're less likely to see that litigation in the Pacific, just because we're not really seeing cases by people against their governments in the Pacific. And I can't help question whether the, the cases you see with litigation with people from the Pacific, they tend to go elsewhere, like they'll sue in courts in Australia for to be able to resettle or New Zealand, or you see them in these international spheres. And I think it probably comes down to um, a culture preferences and maybe just a sense of maybe they don't think the government has the resources to be able to respond in the way that they think are needed. So I think that's more less likely to occur in the Pacific from an adaptation perspective, but I think you'll see it. You will see more cases running those kinds of. I'll stop you there. Thank you, Bryony, very much. James, there's a question coming specifically to you, but I saw Robert, I think, moving your hand, which is an excuse for me to wonder whether you might answer Kevin. You had at the cutting edge in the Supreme Court for a number of years, human rights approaches to compel action and also by private entities. Was it on that you wish to speak or something else? That well, I was just going to comment briefly on the human rights aspect um, because we've had, I mean, the agenda case started off the one in 2015 as a sort of under Dutch tort law and then developed in the Supreme Court and Court of Appeal into a sort of case under the European Convention of Human Rights. Um, and we now have a case, two cases, I think, going to the Strasbourg Court and we'll see what they make of it, whether you can construct a sort of case under either Article 2 or Article 8, as the Dutch court did. But I think it's fair to say that the French court in the Grand Sainte case and also the, um, the Irish court and the Friends of the Earth case were quite skeptical about the value of the human right, the European Convention approach. And I you know, think it, it, it's, it's too general. I think it's, too, I think it's it, one's got to find something rather more specific to build effective rights on. I think there's a quite different issue about uh, migration. I mean, I think there's going to be a big problem about um, climate change driven migration at the moment, the, the such cases there have been have not been very, very positive at all, but somehow that's going to have to develop. But for the moment, I don't see personally human rights aspects driving the, driving the litigation. Thanks very much. Robert, did, Michelle, did you want to come in on that or any other before I go to James with a question from Anna Lisa, and then we have one or two other questions we may run out of time. Michelle, the floor is yours. Thank you. Just a few seconds to respond. Um, I, I do see a lot of human rights uh, cases coming down the line, also from the Global South. And as I was saying in my uh, reaction to the report, I think it is because this is a human rights issue and a social justice issue. And even if it's not a uh, traditional human rights case, it could be used as many other cases that we have seen. Uh, human rights can be used to inform the duties of, of the state for example, in a, in a tort case uh, or the duties of corporations as well. Um, so it's not, I wouldn't write it off yet. And I would hope that we keep on litigating uh, on rights-based claims just because of the nature of the harm uh, and the nature of, of the injustice of having these uh, vulnerable communities uh, being, uh, bearing you know, the, the largest um, effects from climate and being the least culpable uh, right. in causing this crisis over. Terrific, thanks very much for that uh, addition, Michelle. This is for James. Uh, it's from Annalisa Savarisi, who is at uh, UEF and Stirling University, Associate Prof in Environmental Law. James, do you think that the obstacles to the use of judicial review in UK climate litigation significantly differ from those encountered in the use of judicial review in context of UK environmental litigation? So is, is there a big difference in environmental and climate litigation? I take the question mm. to be. And before you answer me, though, you will have the floor first. And knowing that as we begin to wind up, Nigel, you have prior rights. If you wish to wave even subtly at me, I'll bring you in. This is from Chi Zhang, who teaches commercial law at Glasgow Law School. It's a question for all of you. Are there some findings regarding the current trends in climate change litigation involving risk and liability of the insurance sector. So is there stuff going on there? And if climate change litigation continues to rise, insurers and reinsurers may begin, may they not, says Chi Gang, to expressly exclude climate change and what will, what will that entail? So those are my two. And 
Nigel, I think under my coercion, but actually it fits very well. Has his hand up. We go to James first, and then we go to Nigel. I think we may be wrapping up then, guys, but let's see. James. Okay. Well, I'd say in general terms, probably the obstacles are not that different between uh, climate change litigation and other environmental uh, litigation. Um, you know, the role of the court is is, is limited for, for all kinds of reasons on, on judicial review. There's issues about how it can deal with disputed science, which I've certainly spoken about before, and, and those apply right across the board. I think if you're looking for what might be different, I think that other areas of environmental law um, have tended to have far more detailed and developed legislation, like things like habitats. Whereas you know, for climate change, we've had the 2008 Act, although not much use has really been made of it. But one tends to end up looking for international obligations, which are obviously, as we all know, much harder to make work um, than, the, than the domestic legislation that we've got. Um, but I mean, and I think the other issue is, you know, I think in, in the UK, we have got an issue with, um, you know, the government is trying to actually restrict further the ability to go to judicial review. Uh, it will, you know, and if it does that, that's going to make it harder for that to happen. And also, you know, there is a kind of element of threat behind all that, isn't there? I mean, it kind of puts pressure on, on judges. Um, uh, and I think, unfortunately, what the government's doing is probably intended to do that. But, but you know, that, that's the reality of it. So I don't think that there are that, I don't think they are hugely, hugely different. Um, I think there are big challenges uh, if, you're, if you want to be a successful uh, claimant in, in, in environmental education, including climate. Thanks, uh, Robert. I'm, I'm going to, Nigel, before we come to you, and Nigel's will be the last word before I wrap up, guys. But Robert, I can't resist inviting you to comment on what we just heard from James. Hoping you'll make news. Hoping you'll make news. I, I, I'm out of the course now. But I just wanted to say, it's, it's, uh, James reminded me of what something I wanted to say, which was uh, the government sort of saying they've got to somehow the judges are getting above themselves in terms of their review. But actually, if you compare the way we've approached these climate change cases and the way the French Conseil d'État or the German Constitutional Court have approached it. They're far more interventionist than we would ever dream of being. And so I think the government perhaps are being a bit too cautious here. That's what I wanted to say. Very good. Very nice. Thank you very much. Very appropriate. Mm -hmm. And finally, before I wrap up, Nigel. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the question about uh, implications for insurance. This is being taken a lot more seriously by um, the insurance industry, the, um, particularly the UK. So since 2019, all insurers have to take climate risk into account. They have to meet the um, Bank of England's expectations fully by the end of this year in that regard. And part of that is actually taking, um, assessing the risk of climate education, measuring it and so on. The largest insurers are actually going through um, scenario testing at the moment with, uh, and again, it's going to be part of it alongside physical risk and transition risk. They've got to assess the climate risks they've got on their books. Um, query how many of the policies out there would actually respond to the kind of cases we're currently seeing. Thank you very much. Uh, look, we, we, I know we could go on and on, but you don't really want us to. You'd like us to go on and you wouldn't because we said we'd finish at 2.30 and we're going to finish at 2.30. And all time, I think, why waste four minutes? Well, the reason is that actually I want to be your voice I want to be your voice and just say what a terrific, what a terrific session that was. And uh, it was marshaled so well by the organizing team to whom I'll come in a minute, but also by Robert as chair. And it went speedily and efficiently and lost nothing. I particularly admire Nigel's magnificent way of suddenly stopping. It keeps a chair on his or her toes to know that he might be drawn in as he's checking his email or something. So well done, Nigel. But you were all as succinct. And uh, so, so a big thank you from me uh, to Robert, Michelle, Bryony, James and Nigel, but also from me, a big thank you to you. I mean, we can see the number of people who are there and uh, on the very occasions when I'm speaking, it's very sad to see the numbers fall away very steeply. It can be a bit bad for morale. I can assure you that didn't happen here. We have many hundreds of people in the metaphorical room and what a thing it is to have the worldwide involvement. I know that this COVID thing is terrible, but the worldwide effect of Zoom uh, is amazing, is amazing. And we've all seen it elsewhere. But many of your questions, we had scores of questions, uh, we didn't make it as far as me, and even some that did, I wasn't able to get them in. But thank you, because we need the questions to keep the energy levels up, and we certainly got them. Uh, I want also to uh, talk about people who are hiding behind various blank spots on the machine in front of me. 
but who would come in if anything went wrong. And they are the team at Grantham. I think they're mainly Grantham, not sure. Uh, but we have a Tad, uh, a Thorburn, we have Alison Peacock and Merlin Sibley. Of the three I know, I imagine there's a lot of other people uh, who have made it a success technically and also have got it, uh, got you in the room. That's no mean feat. Grantham are amazing at that. I know that. Remember, it's all going towards COP. It's recorded. And so this is part of an energetic engagement, part of an energetic engagement, moving to a moment, which we hope will be not these pivotal moments. Every moment's pivotal, isn't it? But a moment that develops things in a positive way. The last word is not to be given to our two primary people, Joanna and Kate, but the last word should be about Joanna and Kate for having generated such a superb report and having presented it so elegantly and so economically in, 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 at the start of this event. So as my clock turns 14.30, I feel I have another five seconds to crack a joke, but I have no joke. So I will just thank you all and whoever it is behind the scenes that presses whatever button is pressed will mean that this will now end uh, and I will stop speaking.